Udacast, informing your decisions with intelligence, analysis, and insight. Brought to you by the team at OodaLoop.com. All right, I'm Matt DeVoe, CEO of Uda, and this is the Udacast, and we're happy to be joined by John Robb, who I've known in multiple contexts over the years. Uh, he's an author of an interesting book. We've been red teamers on several very interesting red team initiatives uh, and collaborators, collaborators on research, et cetera, over the years. So, John, why don't we start off by you giving a little bit of a background? You know, where did your career start and what are you up to today? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, short version, Air Force Academy, astronautical engineering, pilot training, uh, followed by a couple years in C-130s and then five years in special ops, got drafted into a kind of a tier one counterterrorism unit. Um, that was interesting. <laughs> got out, uh, went to Yale, got an MBA to kind of reboot and um, ended up as a analyst at Forrester, which happened to be in 95. So I was their first internet analyst. <laughs> they kind of sacrificed me to that, but I ended up uh, lucking out. And um, so a lot of coverage in the papers and everything for a couple of years. Uh, as every internet company came through my doors. Um, and then um, uh, started my first company uh, with some friends, uh, Gomez Advisors, which became Gomez. It's a performance testing network that tested the performance of transaction systems at banks and brokerages. That ended up selling for about 295 million, which is kind of nice that you built something that had some lasting potential. Um, then I got involved in um, in 2001 in, in trying to build social networking, building on a report I wrote back at Forrester and um, uh, ended up as CEO of Userland Software and we did the first RSS. Uh, we open sourced that and mm -hmm. then we built the first kind of blogging network where you blogged and then you subscribed and it was an open blogging network back in 2001 when no one really got sure. uh, what social networking was. And then, uh, Facebook and Twitter happened. Looks like the same interface. <laughs> Those got big. And then I ended up doing a bunch of other uh, uh, different uh, companies, global printing company, uh, uh, doing software for the military and social networking. Um, wrote a book uh, after the Gulf War kicked in, uh, Brave New War. Good which is looking right at, here. yep, yep. <laughs> and that was looking at the, how warfare was changing and, and, and we're seeing uh, open source networks uh, applied to warfare, and um, that ended up being pretty prescient in terms of you know describing how Iraq was operating. And then um, uh, since then, I've been doing a variety of different things in writing. I you know been doing a blog on on warfare called Global Guerrillas since 2003. Um, that went and became the Global Guerrillas Report three years ago, and so um, I put that on Patreon to kind of winnow the crowd down to kind of make sure that, that the people that were interacting with me on this uh, uh, were high quality and it's, it's, it's proven to be such. And um, been tracking the intersection of politics, technology and warfare. And it seemed to be uh, right on the mark because that's, you know, the stuff I've been writing about is exactly what we're dealing with today. Yeah, excellent. Let's let's rewind. I definitely want to get into the the global gorillas thematics, um, and we'll put a link uh, in the YouTube comments to make sure people can find that easily. Uh, yep. So transitioning, you know, working with tier one folks on a counterterrorism mission into an MBA program, kind of what lessons did you take? You know, that allowed you from the military experience to transition into the business world. Um. Well, I mean, being in a special ops role is, is really different. It's um, than the standard military experience. Uh, you operate as an outsider. <laughs> you know, I mean, you're given, I mean, no one's given a, like an aircraft and a bunch of cash and go out and do stuff <laughs> in the regular military. It's like very controlled. You have to call before you take off and after you take off and then you get in route, you get a call. And then after you land, um, not, you know, not the case in special ops. Um, so, that made the transition to kind of entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurial life much easier. Um, I was looking, always looking at business opportunities from as an outsider. Um, that worked out good when I got to um, cover the internet because I was already thinking as an outsider and, and so much of what was do, happening on the, in, in the internet space between 95 and 97 was all about trying to break things from the outside. 
mm. disrupt. And um, every company had a disruption message. And, and uh, that, that uh, startup fever was, you know, definitely up my alley. Um, things that uh, I transitioned over, you know, it's just, you know, commitment and the same, you know, uh, kind of work ethic that you have in the military, you know, applying to business that worked out fine. Um, what surprised me though, is I got into finance and, and got into uh, the entrepreneurial space and, and the tech space like Silicon Valley. And I didn't find any ex-military folks. I mean, very, very few were there. Sure. Then, then on the ground, and I thought there would be a lot more of a you know contingent, maybe in finance, and uh, not the case. Uh, I'm surprised that most people just stayed in the Beltway area. <laughs> they kind of graduated into you know consultancies that were go to the airlines. In my case, with pilot piloting, um, all my friends are you know airline pilots. <laughs> so um, it's a it's it was that was surprising. I. I think that you know the military guys that I saw that transitioned into finance did really, really, really well. I mean, you know, extraordinarily well. Um, and there was lots of opportunities for that kind of mindset, a yeah. military mindset that could that were unexploited. It's interesting. I definitely see that you know in my interactions with some of the private equity and venture capital firms, there's a role for some of the military folks transitioning in there, uh, especially yep. coming out of special forces, you know, entities. So there seems seem to recognize the value just in the ability to operate uh, in the critical thinking and you know the kind of leadership associated with that. Uh, yep. You know, being at Forrester in 1995, are there some things that strike you as you know interesting that you saw that you know? represented a groundswell that you thought were going to be really important? Because that is really early days in the commercialization of the internet. Yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't really, I mean, I didn't have a background in IT, which made me kind of an outlier in Forrester. Mm -hmm. And Forrester had been going sideways as a, you know, about $20 million company for many, many years, focusing on those core IT subjects. Um, so it, it, you know, they allowed me to be creative in terms of trying to uh, synthesize frameworks for understanding how this fast moving situation was developing. Um, and these frameworks, I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing is, you know, when things are changing so quickly, uh, there's really not any time for uh, considered analysis where you take, you know, build these, do this extensive analysis and, and you know, write 70 page reports on it and, and, and really dig in into all the details. What you need is, uh, is a framework. And I found that uh, decision makers at virtually every company during that period, 95 through 97, were uh, floored. They didn't know what to do. They were paralyzed by the internet and what was happening, um, what was coming. And what I tried to do is develop frameworks. What I'm doing now at the, at, at the Global Gorillas Report is develop frameworks for understanding or you know, uh, parsing the news as it's developing. Uh, you know, you, you, there's like pigeonholes for where, where, where you could put, you know, different news items in. Um, for instance, I, I wrote a report on uh, what I called navigation hubs in the in early 95, just before the portals went public. And I said, okay, these guys, and I ranked them, you know, from Yahoo up, on down, are the, going to be the you know, centers of the internet. And they're going to, every content provider is going to need to slot in to their hubs in order to make money on the internet. Um, and that would help people, you know, get their heads around the emerging situation in a way that allowed them to act. And some cut deals with Yahoo or in, in different portals uh, that allowed them to, you know, gain a full hold on the internet. Um, and, uh, it, you know, that's, and then I wrote a report a little later in the year uh, on what I called uh, personal broadcast networks. This idea that uh, we would be publishing, everybody would be publishing onto the, the internet pictures and text and the like, and then we'd all be subscribing to each other in this big network. Uh, <laughs> that was a thought piece, and, and I had the guys at Netscape and Microsoft come and you know, say, ask me, you know, how do you build this thing? And, and, and I go, I don't know. I mean, I, Pointcast may be a good example of an early mm -hmm. instantiation of it, but um, it got people thinking at least along those lines. And it took me four years or five years to find a company that actually building it, UserLand. So, yeah. um, so uh, that's what I try to do. Sometimes it's like 
long term, you know, something like the, the uh, personal broadcast networks or uh, something short term for decision makers to unfreeze them, unparalyze them, so they can, you know, act and, and interact with a, you know, fast changing environment. Yeah. So I love that uh, dynamic of, you know, leaders not being able to act because the environment is changing too quickly or they feel like they don't have the data points. Um, do you think that the pace of change has been, you know, increasing steadily over time or are we seeing today the same types of paralysis that you were seeing back in 1995 to 97? I think it's worse now. <laughs> um, we're getting a rapid technological change. And then in addition to that, we're getting rapid social change rapid political change, um, it's, it's paralyzing. And um, not knowing what comes next, you know, makes it impossible to plan. Uh, if every bit of news that you, you get is a surprise, you're, you just, your mm -hmm. natural tendency is just to sit there and wait till the news settles down or, you know, till you could start to make sense of, of what's, what's happening before you act. And, um, and it, no one wants to act and then find out the next day that they're, they've taken the wrong path. Yeah. It can be fatal in this uh, mm. situation. Uh, you can be mobbed <laughs> and swarmed. Yeah, um, yeah go ahead. Uh, well, no, I was just going to say on that kind of the, the pace of change and that uh, you know, in, inability to act or creating frameworks. I mean, are there some frameworks for what we're seeing today that you think are useful to help people decipher kind of the global environment that we're in? Yeah, um, one thing I've been working on is you know, I've, ex I've taken the uh, open source framework that I used in warfare and moved it to protest. We saw that happen in, in mm -hmm. uh, the Middle East uh, almost a decade ago. Not, yeah. not quite. Not quite um, yeah. Yeah, but it's also being proving useful in this current context. Um, it's changing the way we conduct politics in the United States. And what we're seeing right now is the emergence of a new decision-making system. You might call it network tribalism. Um, and it's uh, proving to be very powerful where you know, a, a network forms online and it's open source in the sense there's no you know, set leadership and there's lots of people contributing to it. And they get s focused on a single idea and they push it forward, they make it happen. I mean, we saw just recently um, you know, shut down the economy in response to COVID. I mean, it was the individual actions of, of tens of millions of people that really did the heavy lifting on that, more so than, than what the states did with their shutdown orders. Um, and it's keeping it in place now, even after the shutdown orders have, have been lifted. People are still staying home. They still don't think it's safe. Um, so that's kind of this network tribalism is, is, is uh, very powerful. Um, it also, uh, you know, when it gets focused on a on a on an issue, it can you know take to the streets. And we're seeing that in, you know as it's taking to the streets, uh, you know around the around the, the country, uh, focusing on on uh, getting control of of police forces and kind of equalizing the power balance between uh, the public and and police. Um, yeah, network tribalism is 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 a Put it in a larger frame. Uh, I used uh, David Ronfeld's uh, Tim and David Ronfeld from uh, Netwars. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a brand for many, many years. He came up with a, a framework for understanding uh, how things are changing over a longer time period since since you know uh, 500 years ago. Uh, is that we have these big social decision making systems which is right up our alley with UDA, right? Mm -hmm. Big social decision making systems. And uh, before the printing press and the reformation, uh, it was feudalism and, and a universal church. Uh, what we had since then is, is a nation state and, and bureaucracy and markets. Um, he, uh, he says, okay, there's three decision making systems that we currently use in society and we refined them and, and made them viable. It was bureaucracy, which is great at mobilizing. It's great at uh, uh, executing on, on plans. Uh, we have markets, great for allocating, discovering information. Uh, and then um, tribalism, which became nationalism, um, which gives us cohesion because we have to have a certain level of cohesion in order to operate as a unit. Uh, if you don't have that cohesion uh, and you treat 
if your countrymen are, are now enemies, you don't trust anything they say. Uh, and what we're adding is now a network layer, uh, uh, you know, fourth. Uh, but what I think is happening is that network layer is now replacing uh, what was tribalism, what was nationalism and patriotism, uh, supplanting it. And um, it's putting pressure on bureaucracy uh, because it's making decisions faster. It made decisions faster in terms of COVID than the bureaucracy does. The bureaucracy mm -hmm. seems to be uh, flailing. Um, and that uh, it's more powerful than markets. This network tribalism is more powerful than markets because it was able to shut down the economy uh, through the actions of, of tens of millions of people changing their demand for products and services, uh, not flying, not taking vacations, not purchasing things, uh, not going to restaurants. Uh, Network action is, is, is proving more powerful than, than the market decision-making system in that regard. Um, so learning to understand that, and there's lots of nuance and lots of interesting things that can be added onto that. Um, uh, I have plenty of reports that I wrote about in regards to this. Uh, and looking at it from maybe the international stage too, is you know, how does this networking concept apply to places like China? And in, in China where they're actually the state is taking control of, of this network decision-making system and then enforcing its use. And, uh, you know, from the social credit system that they're doing to getting all the companies and everybody to express publicly online that they're aligned with the state's actions. Uh, that's a, you know, this is a pretty cool space. It's a framework for understanding it once you start to read it and start to get it. And everything, mm -hmm. every bit of news that you start to get now starts to fall in place and you can put it in the right categories. Um, it, it makes it easier to you know, make sense of it and then it makes you feel better because you at least you have some knowledge of where things are going. Yeah. With that, do you have to have the awareness with regards to how adversaries might try and impact that network tribalism? Because you know, if I went to a town meeting, it was my neighbors sitting next to me. Now, if I'm participating in this you know, network version of it, there are also adversaries and folks that don't share the same geography that might try and influence that. So how do you protect against that external influence component? Yeah, I, I, it's hard, but um, in the case of the US, and the US is probably alone in this, uh, I think the volume of what we produce internally is so great that it, it kind of overshadows anything that China and Russia can do. Yeah. It's, just, it's just, they're lost in the noise. Now, if I was a smaller country, boy, it can make all the difference in the world. Manipulate Facebook in the right way. You get places like the Philippines with 90% of their news they get through Facebook. Yeah. I mean, that is a, like a place where you could really have a serious amount of influence if you're an external player with some smarts. Um, here in the U.S., not so. Uh, you know, we're, uh, we're kind of developing this an open decision-making system, and it's messy and it's loud and there's so many dissenting voices and it's uh, so hard for anyone outside to even be heard. It's, they could spend a hundred times what they're spending now and it would just be a drop in the bucket compared to what, what's, what we produce is a, just a byproduct of our internal discussions. So it seems to me the most important thing that you just talked about with regards to developing the resiliency, I get the volume aspect of it, uh, but the the counter voices, right? The dissent and not sharing opinions. Because an analogy I used to use that's, that's still in play is, you know, in some cultures in Africa where we're rapidly introducing Facebook and other social networks, and in fact, they're building the network for them. Uh, so obviously that's kind of the first source of content that they consume. They didn't have the, 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 uh, the way to discern a picture as not being real. Right, to them, photography was something that couldn't be manipulated. So you saw where there were very, very effective info op campaigns early on where the population, it would be something you and I would recognize as a really bad Photoshop that was actually influencing right. the decisions of the population. Now I get concerned because I consider myself to be very well versed in information operations, psychological operations. There are content that I encounter every week that I am having a hard time discerning the reality of. 
right, without a lot of research. Right. Uh, and, right. and the cheat, the way that I cheat on that is I wait to see the dissenting opinion. I wait to see the person who says, I know this is Photoshop or digs up the photo of Hitler in that same pose, not holding a Bible, right? I mean, it, uh, so it seems like there's great power to the network to be a little bit self-policing in that regard. Yeah, I agree um, that we're learning to uh, leverage our network. I, I've made the case that we're only as smart as our network now. Mm -hmm. Because you can't do all of this. You can't verify the information effectively alone. Um, you can't uh, work through a lot of these topics that we're dealing with alone. We, you have to do it with a, with a group of people uh, that you trust. Uh, maybe even not trust, but you, that they tend to have high quality uh, contributions. Uh, but uh, yeah, building a good network is, is key to surviving this. I mean, it's part of it... Uh, it goes back to, you know, Marshall McLuhan and, you know, with his, he, his early stuff was amazing um, in terms of how uh, electronic media is rewiring our brains. It's changing the way we think. Mm -hmm. And because it's changing the way we think, it's going to change the way we organize society. And he was maybe too early when he was saying it in the 60s, but now it's right on target. Um, that we're becoming more tribal in our thinking. And uh, that's, that's, unleashes a whole set of problems, but also opportunities. Uh, the problems being that we tend to focus on, on every single little action of everybody in the tribe. You know, they take the video of that person saying this and it, it, it blows up and everyone's like pointing the fingers. It's just like, a, if it's like the, uh, the old lady in the village who knows everybody's business. And if something, somebody does something wrong, everybody kind of piles on. Um, uh, it also uh, could, could can set up situations where we all think the same thing, you know, a hyper consensus of sorts. Um, and then we act as a unit and that can be uh, pretty scary. I mean, like we're seeing it with the, the COVID response. I mean, initially it was good, did the job. It, it, it blunted the, the spread of COVID in the U S but getting out of it on the back end, um, whether or not it's the right time to do it um, is good getting people to re-engage with the economy and get out of the siege mode, that consensus thinking mode is going to be really, really tough. And we just don't have the tools for that. Um, you know, the bureaucratic tools are just not available. I mean, you know, thinking in terms of maybe giving people, you know, everybody a stipend of money over a course of a year or two, you know, a thousand bucks a, a month in order to get them to start spending and start re-engaging, uh, you know, kind of a whole population, you know, Pedal, you know, paddles to the chest kind of up uh, might work, but our bureaucracy couldn't even get their heads around something like that. It's just too outlandish. It's, it doesn't work yeah. for them. Yeah. So there's, there's two kind of the divergent threads I want to pull on there. The first is, you know, around the tribalism aspect. Uh, we saw it particularly around COVID, right? You talked about the individual decision making. Right on the network, I would say kind of the next year of decision making was kind of in the corporate domain. And then the last was in the government space, right? We had a lot of corporations that were acting before the governments. If we put it kind of like a sci-fi hat on it, you know, this, this idea of, uh, for, you know, like Cory Doctorow, you have a, a tribe associated with the time zone that you're in or a Bruce Sterling or a Neil Stevenson, where you start to have yeah. more affiliation for a particular company than you do for a country, uh, you know, organized in a national construct. Do you think that that uh, issues like COVID's help reinforce or drive us more towards that kind of corporate affiliation, or is that just a science fiction pipe dream? Hmm. Um, I'm seeing it more at the macro level, you know, macro tribes. Hmm. Uh, at the national level, we're seeing you know, tribe development. I haven't seen so much development at the, at the corporate level where the, where the primary loyalties are now to companies. Um, yeah, it, it, I would have thought it would be, you know, something that would pop up as a result of this, but I, I'm not seeing it. Um, people are, you know, more focused on what we're doing at a national level and trying to align their actions with everybody else. Uh, I think it has to do with, you know, one of the ways it changes the way we think, I mean, being, you know, becoming part of the network is that we become pattern matchers more than we were, you know, solitary literary thinkers. We used to get a book or read an article and we read it in, in isolation and then we acted based on that. 
uh, we formed our opinions based on you know, considered reflection. Um, now we're pattern matching. We're, we're grabbing bits and pieces of data as it flows over us. We're letting most of it just flow past us. And then we're making setting up patterns. And, and uh, the more dominant patterns that we're working on are the big national patterns. Um, occasionally, there's pattern matchers that kind of cleave off like QAnon and, 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 and others who create those kind of conspiracy patterns. Mm. Um, they never really get that big, but it, they become very tightly woven and interconnected and everyone spends it their entire day grabbing bits and pieces of data to stick into that pattern. Um, is it possible that companies could do that? Um, perhaps. Um, I, think it's, I think it's more focused right now is whether companies are aligning with the national uh, pattern, uh, yeah. the national the kind of tribal consensus of sorts. It's, um, can you see it in China it, where they were looking for alignment? Um, you know, kind of the big challenge of the 21st century for nations is to stay cohesive given how complex and cha chaotic the environment is. It, it will tend to rip you apart, as we're seeing. Um, they do it by having the state run the network and, and forcing companies to all align. Uh, in the states, we've let it, we don't have the government dictating that. And what we have is this tribal network emerging online, and it's trying to get all these companies to align, kind of uh, express that kind of a fealty to it, to, towards the network. Um, and enact it like in the case of the big platforms censorship of the platform in the way that conforms to the needs of the of the tribal mm -hmm. network uh, uh, or uh, you know enacting policies and the like that that align with it um, if you don't then you could end up as the kind of the target of this network and they can take you down mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very it's, it's very coercive it's it it can be it could it could be fatal in the street, for instance, in Hong Kong, um, they were trying to set up a, a alternative network, you know, where they had the alignment of companies in Hong Kong with the protesters. And what they did is they, they marked the shops uh, and, and, and people knew the shops that were aligned with the protest. Um, and so they didn't vandalize those locations and the ones that were aligned with the Chinese government, they vandalized. So uh, it has a, you know, we see a little bit of that in the, in the States with the, you know, black owned business or I support the protests mm -hmm. on, on the front window. And that gave you a little bit of protection. Um, but it's that kind of, everyone's trying to signal an alignment uh, in order to avoid damage. It's interesting. Um, even the shop owners in the U S who had their you know, shops destroyed, even after the fact they would say, okay, I agree with the protests in order to keep their alignment intact, mm -hmm. even though they had their, you know, Whole, whole yeah. world turned up, turned upside down. So um, alignment—that's going to be a big thing to process as a as a business owner. And who do you align with? And it, the tides change quickly, right? When we talk about right. Facebook going into COVID nineteen, they've got all their employees working from home. They gave them a thousand dollars, you know, extra money to spend. Uh, they put, you know, hundred million dollar grants into local businesses so that they would be sustained. And now, what is everybody talking about today? It's failure to censor the president on the platform. Right. It's a, right. A very quick reversal, just over sixty to ninety days. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, COVID. You know, and you talked about surprises and you know predicting surprise and having a framework for how to deal with it being the essence of you know, being able to make decision making. You and I probably sat and you know, we've done so many red teams, I can't remember which ones we were together in or not. Uh, but you know, post September 11th, there are quite a few that were looking at these issues of um, biological disease spread uh, and responses right. to that and kind of how it plays out. Yet it seemed to me, you, know, you fast forward uh, 15 years later, and we seem to have kind of lost the needle on understanding the risks and the responses and being able to make decision making. Is there is that just a, a failure to sustain the cognitive infrastructure behind some of those things that we studied? Or how can we best enable you know future leaders to be able to make decisions based on past analysis, I guess? Okay, so yeah, that's how do we improve the decision making capability of the bureaucracy? Yeah. Or, yeah. And I mean, the, most of the problems that we had with the COVID early on were because the bureaucracy that planned for it 
was planning for a slower virus. And they weren't planning for a 21st century hyper-connected virus. Where, uh, for instance, uh, the FDA gave the CDC monopoly production rights on the, on the testing. Okay, so they were focused on quality because quality was more sure. important to them than anything else because they didn't want to give people wrong, the, the, the wrong results. Um, and rather than just trying to get as many tests out there as possible because this is about to hit us and you know, there's no way to kind of uh, yeah. do this in a controlled way. Well, um, that cost us because then the CDC failed and they were a single point of failure and, the, and put us back a, behind a month. And, and it, by then, it, you know, all of the casualties we have are, are larger a result of not knowing that we even had the virus in the country sure. because of lack of testing. Or, um, you know, thinking in terms of only shutting off travel with countries based on, you know, considered reflection and, and deliberation, that you could, you could actually slow the transmission of virus from one country to the next by, you know, slowly turning off country by country. Well, in this age, you know, you, you take five seconds to reroute yourself around the the blockage and then you're sure. you're in and um what you need to do is shut everything off shut all the borders and the countries that did the best on this you know everything from new zealand to taiwan to japan to even south korea because effectively it's it's, a, it's an island uh turned themselves into islands they shut off connection mm. very early on and and stopped the kind of ongoing inflow of, of infection we've never really done that we still haven't done it sure um so, you know, changing the way, you know, the bureaucracy thinks is, is tough because, I mean, they thought they were doing the right thing. Uh, even, the, even the PPE uh, production, I mean, they thought they had time to ramp up production. Mm. I mean, granted, they hadn't been watching the needle on, on our PPE production go down to 5%, which was a disaster at a national security level. Yeah. Uh, only 5% of the stuff we needed was produced here. Um, but they thought they had months to ramp up to, to aggregate the, 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 the uh, stores that we did have. Um, also, there's problems with the way that the bureaucracy made decisions is that they, they took a kind of a, I know better than you attitude. And that was just fatal in this environment where the information is, is, is so prevalent. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like telling people uh, back in March uh, that masks don't work, it's just nuts. Yeah. It's absolutely insane that anyone who kind of would say that masks don't work. I mean, a hundred years of, of infection control in hospitals and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, masks, everybody uses masks. I mean, it's just a matter of course. And um, to say to the public, just because it was, a, they thought it was a noble lie, right? That they would say that to the public because they wanted to save masks for the uh, frontline workers, uh, first responders. And, um, but people saw it as a noble, they didn't see it as a noble lie, they saw it as a lie. Mm -hmm. They saw it as, as incompetence. Uh, and we have examples of that again and again as, 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 as time progresses. You, you have to be upfront, you have to be collaborative uh, with the public in this kind of environment. Uh, you have to solve problems together. Uh, you know, it's just like uh, another failure. CDC didn't, lost control of the testing numbers. By mid-March, they stopped collecting because they couldn't collect from every single state. They didn't have the people allocated to do it. They just gave up. And we had to have an open source effort come out of the Atlantic reporters. You know, they started it to gather the testing numbers for the entire U.S. Hmm. Can you imagine that? I, <laughs> I think there was a kind of a lost opportunity here. Is that, you know, we had the White House talking about what they were doing you know, for a couple hours, and it was off on different meandering things that, that they decided to talk about, is that we had a, a chance here to run some counter-programming for this consensus. All these 100 plus million people who are interested in trying to do something today for solving the crisis. Back in, you know, back in March, we could have started this. Two hours of YouTube programming where we're focusing on solutions. Forget the politics. What do we have to do next? Oh, we have to produce masks. Okay. We don't have enough masks for first responders. Let's produce cloth masks. Okay, how do we how do we check on this and this? You know, how do we get uh, resources that we need to to you know do this project? Let's set up a committee to do that. And here's the website to 
to, to actually get that done and then coordinating it using this you know, national broadcast every day. And that would have given us a focal point of, of you know, like we're actually getting things done and, and, and solving this together. Um, again, you know, waiting for the government to tell us what we're going to do and how they're going to solve it for us is, is uh, not the way we should be moving forward. Yeah. That's interesting. So you'd say kind of one of the biggest impacts was just failure to predict the pace at which it was moving, right? So the planning process was a little bit more drawn out, vice accelerated. Right. I mean, even inside China, um, I mean, I don't believe the Chinese numbers a second because they got it over to 100, 100 plus cities by the time they started their efforts. So there's, you know, Chinese death numbers. There's no way that they, they had those numbers, those results. But um, just difference between when they had SARS in 2001 or so, um, it, the amount of transportation had grown fourfold between then and now inside China and China to the rest of the world. Um, so people were so much more mobile and, and the fluidity of the, that movement was so much greater than any kind of models that we had from the 80s and 90s or even the, the odds. Uh, one thing I found from looking at so many epide epidemiological models and, and how people put them together thought is that those things were filled with assumption errors and, and you know, old ways of thinking, like assuming that if they uh, called for social distancing, only 10% would comply. Interesting. Like what? We're getting 60, 70% 60, com compliance. I mean, Massachusetts never even had a, uh, a formal, you know, it was all voluntary for uh, uh, shelter in place orders. Hmm. So, uh, and we got virtually complete compliance. Wow. So, um, you know, it's those, it, those models are, 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 are useful, but they're uh, often, you know, we're not, we're not going back to these models and trying to update them based on the new, the evolving circumstances, yeah, right, yeah. because in a complex world, in a complex in environment, we're getting hit by a complex threat that leverages these networks and leverages that complexity. You have to rework your models. You have to look at which factors are actually most important and find those factors and then build a new model based on those mm -hmm. um, or update all the assumptions that go into the, the existing model based on your experience. Uh, and it has to be done quick or you know, you're going to be left to, without any yeah. forecasting capability. Yeah. So I mean, what it's calling for is the dynamic decision-making, right? The essence of the OODA loop. It's not make a decision right. and you're done. It's make a decision, reevaluate, make a decision, reevaluate. Right. Uh, we saw a lot of attempts at very static decision-making, you know, this will oh, yeah. be the truth. This will be the, you know, uh, the plan for the next six weeks when maybe in reality we could have been, you know, working at a little bit more accelerated cycle there. Yeah, um, it, in, a, in a complex environment, uh, everything, the tendency of the whole network can change overnight. You, you think you're doing one thing and then all of a sudden the world changes and you're out of step. Uh, or based on the way you've analyzed the current environment, your plan should have this result, but it doesn't, right? Uh, so what you need to do is you have to do a lot of probes, you have to do a lot of trials, find out what works based on hidden factors that you hadn't considered, uh, and then reinforce the one that works and, and, and build up on that. The tinkering approach that we see so often in open source, um, that works really nicely in this environment. And then uh, uh, there's a more formal process for actually doing that within companies, which is pretty useful. Um, and then uh, also being willing to be flexible uh, Revisit your assumptions. Revisit your 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 uh, your models. Uh, look for new factors. Look for new patterns. Um, yeah, that's new frameworks for understanding what was going what yeah. is going on. Yeah, uh, yeah. UDA, You know um, what's really plaguing people if you if you boil it down to UDA from a UDA perspective is um, orientation. And I always thought orientation is the key to the UDA. It's mm -hmm. the most important piece. In fact, that could be blown out. Uh, and there's probably, there's many attempts to try to do it, but it's really hard to do. It, that's mm -hmm. like the combined, it's everything that you are points you in one direction or another. And what we're having right now, given the pace of change and the way things are changing, um, 
you know, we're getting, you're entering a completely new environment is that our orientation, it's an orientation crisis. Uh, we're not, all our experience and all our training and all our uh, organizational structure and is, is geared in one direction, but the reality is pointing us in another. Mm. You know, the opportunity space is, is, is in a different direction. And uh, you have to, you should orient to what the environment demands. You know, it's not orient to what, what history sure. taught you. Yeah. Um, and orientation crisis requires new frameworks, and that's what I would try to build. So you talked about network tribalism as being a useful framework. Are there others that you would highlight, you know, that would be useful for people to be considering right now? Oh, wow. I, you know, I did a lot of stuff on AI, did a lot of stuff on McLuhan, um, did dug into the different modes of, of kind of the political, sociopolitical warfare, you know, more warfare online, uh, disruptive warfare, kind of maneuver based, uh, kind of more of what the Trump does, you know, fast transients, rapid disruptions, and how those all work. Um, and if you understand that, it, you can make sense of Trump in about 10 seconds. <laughs> and you can make sense of the counter pressure uh, from in terms of uh, you know, how they think and how they operate. I mean, more warfare works in a specific way and it works in a specific way online. Um, yeah, so many. I mean, I have a lot of frameworks. It's just yeah. that you know, I could probably fill multiple podcasts getting into yeah, each yeah. one of these things. Excellent. But yeah, um, you know, pattern matching, how it's changing the way we think, how, that, mm -hmm. how, how empathy plays into that because a lot of this tribal formation is, is based on shared empathy. And a lot of these videos and pictures you get you know, are supposed, supposed to trigger an empathic response. Mm -hmm. And the extreme versions of that is that, uh, is that uh, extreme empathy can lead to those violent pop-offs that we see. I mean, if you read the kind of those, those uh, you know, white nationalists that went and shot up different locations, all their writing was extremely empathic, but it was selective empathy. Hmm. You know, my people are being killed and I can't, I can't stand to see this anymore. You know, we're being crushed. You know, all my family and all my friends and, and everybody I know is, is, is being, being destroyed by this environment. I have to act. But it, it's no care for the people that are killing. You know, it's, you remember the um, uh, apocalypse now? Yeah. Colonel Kurtz was saying, oh, you know, uh, he wish he had soldiers that could, you know, be barbarians during the day and then come home and be peaceful at night and kiss mm -hmm. their wives, good, you know, kiss their kids good night and not be bothered by it. And those tribesmen were able to do it, but he couldn't get his Western soldiers to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all done through kind of this selective empathy. People outside of your tribe are not worthy of empathy. People mm -hmm. inside your tribe get all of it. Interesting. Um, yeah, when you tell a story to a tribesman, uh, they put them. It, empathy is kind of a, it isn't what we think it is. Is we we tend to talk of empathy as kind of a voluntary action. It's actually an involuntary modeling. Is your brain is modeling uh, the person you're empathizing with. You you get similar facial expressions. You get similar tenseness in your body if they're under attack. Uh, or they're describing that they were under attack. It's an involuntary process. Uh, mm. And uh, triggering that, if it's properly triggered, that means that you're empathizing with that person. That means you're, if, you, uh, if you do, you're, you're connected. You're part of the same tribe. Yeah. Um, and like a sociopath can fake empathy, but they may not have had the, the involuntary triggers when they were young and then they became developmentally kind of disabled. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting, it's a whole, you know, how that works online and how those like pictures and videos you get and how, you know, people are saying, can't you feel my pain kind of thing? Or, you know, mm. can't you see how this is like egregious? I mean, what we're seeing right now in the, in the big protests are all, you know, calling for empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, empathy being the key to building the new narratives for a tribe. Mm -hmm. Tribes are found around Tribal formation is, you know, we have a shared story about what makes us unique, uh, what things we have, uh, adversities we've overcome, uh, and uh, what, why we're better together than apart, 
and those stories are communicated through empathy. I identify with them. And we're getting those stories right now through this network. I identify with this man, I identify with the things that need to be done. Yeah. Problem with that, of course, is that the people outside of that tribe, you can lose all empathy for them. Yeah. Interesting. So, I mean, that's just one little, there's one little framework yeah. and it's just, a, it's an interesting yeah. way of kind of understanding what you're seeing every day. Um, but I, I think I went down a little bit too much on the rabbit hole on that <laughs> yeah, one. But. No, no. It's all good. I think you're fine. We got uh, the folks that, that watch these episodes, uh, they're like going down the rabbit holes. At least that's what we right. found. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit, you know, given that you've been so uh, prescient on kind of emerging threat environments, you know, what do you think are some of the emerging threats that we face over the next five to 10 years? Oh, I mean, ex externally or internally? Uh, either. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're going to be pretty focused on the internal dynamics and getting this right. I mean, hammering out how to use network decision making is going to be traumatic it's already traumatic it's going to get worse mm -hmm. um, i mean just think of it uh, is that uh, going from feudalism and the universal church and that way of thinking those it's a completely different switch when you start to go to the nation state and you start to use markets and you start to use uh, you know nationalism as a as a mechanism and those didn't appear overnight they weren't kind of they're that switch out of that Old mindset to the new mindset you know, ripped apart Germany and probably you know, the Thirty Years' War is probably the bloodiest war in uh, European history. Uh, and um, yeah, that could be traumatic. So I think most of the stuff that we're going to deal with is, is, is internal. Hopefully it doesn't end up like Germany mm -hmm. uh, during the Thirty Years' War. Uh, but you know, there's always an outlier a situation where that could happen. Um, externally? I think uh, most countries are going to be dealing with something similar, um, or they're you know going to go through a kind of a lockdown phase, uh, like China's doing. They're locking everything down using networks. I, I call that you know the end state of that when you start using social AIs, which are the biggest AIs that we've we've developed so far mm -hmm. um, and put into play uh, to kind of enforce social cohesion, could end up becoming kind of the what I call the long night. If that propagates, if China is able to export that or if people copy that and that becomes the dominant approach, uh, we'll have a kind of a, a long night of oppression because it doesn't just, uh, you know, watch what you do publicly. I mean, it can get into every single private communication and, and, and change that and alter that uh, or censor that and use that against you. Yeah. Uh, and then you add sensors and you add all this other stuff that we're surrounding ourselves with and it becomes a, the ultimate nightmare. Mm. Interesting. Um, so it's the kind of the, the AI used to invoke that because the AI is the only thing that's going to have the processing power to basically put, you know, put all the pieces together. Well, yeah. I mean, if you want to censor the community, the private communications of, of a billion people, you have to have an AI. You have to have AI, yeah. Yeah, but it is, we're going to train them. I mean, we're, we're constantly finding the exceptions, the things that pop up, running it by human filters, and they're trading AIs, and that's a constant process. So much of what will constitute new jobs in the future will be that human fields the, the new thing. Mm -hmm. They develop a response to it, and that goes into the AI. I mean, just like an Uber driver, you know, their response goes into their AI. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we can do that with every profession. It's a, like a everything that we do is going to be uh, yeah. set up in that situation or that kind of process. Yeah. It's um, interesting. We, we gave, uh, we just did a uh, UDA cast with Peter Singer. Uh, oh yeah. Who with August Cole just wrote a book called burn in. And yep. uh, I don't know if you've read it yet, but the premise oh, yeah, is I got an early the, copy of that. That's good. Okay, yeah. 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 As did I, I mean, so, you know, I mean, it was a, uh, an AI robot that was, you know, paired with a law enforcement official for this process of kind of teaching it how to operate uh, with, you know, for me, I love the plot. I mean, it was a lot of fun. I love the, the look at technology and I love the fact that the technology was all based on stuff that exists today. But yeah. what was really fascinating for me were those sequences when the FBI agent was actually training the AI. Right. Do this, don't do that, you know, in the future uh, and its ability to kind of, you know, input that and adapt its behavior on the fly based on the new parameters. It was kind of fascinating yeah. to me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a, 
I mean, I love the book and, and I, I love the, the whole interaction, um, but I'm, I think the, the main course of AI won't be towards humanoid. We tend to think of it as kind mm -hmm. of a human replica. I see it as the word the AI is really going to take off and it's already taken off is in this kind of, it's not a human, it's kind of a symbiont. Sure. You know, it's like the social AI that we interact with every day on Facebook and, and, and Twitter and, and Google and Amazon. Those things are, they don't look human at all. Mm. And they're interacting, they're, they're kind of living in the space between us as individuals. They're, they're mediating our, our interaction. Um, and to think of them as that is, you know, getting, trying to get inside our, you know, perceptions to kind of influence us at a, at a deeper level. That's a different thing entirely. It's not humanoid in any way, shape or form. It's, sure. it's, it, but it doesn't live without us. It's, it, it, yeah. it, it's a kind of a thing that we swim in, but it's living in a sense, and, but it doesn't look human and it doesn't act human. That is going to be the dominant form of AI. The, yeah, the AI as part of the infrastructure as opposed yeah. to something we personify. Yeah, no, yeah I agree. I, yeah, and it, but it's a living interaction with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like a living infrastructure because yeah. it lives between us and around us. And uh, it's not the kind of robot that sits uh, you know, across the table from us that we're, we're trying yeah. to teach. And the machines are, you know, uh, or the AI is even more empowered day to day because I know like, on Facebook and Twitter, I mean, they control what you see, you know, to a greater extent every day. Uh, right. I used to have, I used to have lists of people on Facebook that I would want to say, like, I want to view this list and I want to just view it in chronological order. I, I want right. to see everything. I want to see the raw stream. And it's incredibly difficult to get some of those feeds in raw stream format. Now you have that level of AI interpretation happening everywhere. Right. And yeah, that's, that's the downside of these AI projects. Um, you know, the uh, paperclip maximizer problem, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a, I mean, and we see that happening all the time at the big, at the big mm -hmm. uh, tech companies. Um, now, like the paperclip maximizer is this idea that if you set a goal for an AI and they iterate towards that goal, uh, the way in which they achieve it could end up being fatal. And in the case of giving an AI the opportunity to, or the goal of trying to maximize the production of paperclips, they end up growing and in, in learning how to acquire no, new companies and then learning how to defend those companies and acquire mm -hmm. new resources and then taking over the world and burying mm -hmm. it in a mile deep of a paper clips and, and then go into space and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, in Facebook's case, it would be um, trying to maximize stickiness on, on the site. Uh, they amplified the stuff that was most volatile. Yeah. Uh, the stuff that's most inflammatory because people stuck with it. I mean, or in YouTube, you know, they, they mm -hmm. bring you down that kind of, ex, you know, rabbit hole. And sometimes, and oftentimes that, that's an extremist rabbit hole. That's um, a great point. We've probably have had AI provoked deaths or killing. We just don't know of them yet. Right. Because we don't right. understand the way individuals were influenced by those platforms towards a set of behaviors. Uh, you no, know, they don't eat. They don't either. Cause those are the, the there's no algorithms to, to look at. I mean, yeah. they're black boxes, they're neural networks. So, you know, it, as it iterates, um, all you can do is then to kind of evaluate the effectiveness of an AI, I mean, a, a deep learning based AI, which mm -hmm. is really the only method that we found that actually achieves, achieves some yeah. superior results, is to look at the outcome and test it. Kind of like if you, were, if you had an AI pilot, is that you'd give it a check flight. And you put it through as many maneuvers as possible and look at the outcome. Yeah. Um, and it, it's not like a, you could do with a, with a missile, a guided missile, and, and you could check subsystems and, and, and drill mm -hmm. down on things. Um, this is more of a qualitative analysis, yeah. right? Um, and qualitative analysis is, that, you know, does this work in the real world? And one of the hardest fields in AI right now is explainable AI, right? Getting the opportunity to understand the decisions that it's making or, or how it's being influenced. So, yeah, um, yeah. human I don't explainable. Think, yeah. yeah, I don't think it is. Well, it, it, any more than you would be able to get a, a, a human being to explain all the influences that made them mm -hmm. do what they do. I mean, you train up somebody and then explain how you came to this decision or that's really they don't necessarily know why they came up to that decision. Yeah. It was just an interplay of factors, um, experiences. The more complex the task, the harder it is. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to think of it as a, you know, 
the same thing as you go through with training a, a human being. Um, or really simple is if you're training, you know, teaching a kid how to catch a baseball, they're not doing physics and they're not doing math. They're doing a complex neural net calculation is the, mm -hmm. you know, where the trajectory of the ball, how that works, how, you know, how to catch it with your hands and how to do that successfully. Um, they can't explain it. They can't explain how they did it. Sure. And it's a black box. It, and if you did the same thing with a, with a deep learning AI, they're, they're not going to be able to explain it. Um, and I don't know how much the explanation would, would benefit you. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's true. Yeah. Right. That's, it's just, yeah, I like that analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the results, test the results. Mm -hmm. If it works most times, you're probably there. And these AIs tend to be pretty robust uh, in regards to, you know, a lot of the little things that would normally set off a, a, a human engineered system, you know, uh, they tend to overlook them. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the human engineered systems, uh, you, you put in a, a little error and it can cause cascades of failure. Oh, I, you know, you, you know, the robot that stops because there's a, a P mm -hmm. on the floor in front of them, that kind of thing. These deep learning link, AIs tend to just barrel through regardless. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, less, less prone to that kind of thing, at least from my experience and what I've read in, uh, in terms of talking to people too. Yeah. Excellent. Speaking, speaking of reading, what are some books that are kind of on your, uh, you know, recently read list that you'd recommend for the folks in the audience? Um, well, I did burn in, Burnin, that was yeah. most recent. Yep. And then, um, Oh, uh, Delta V. I would recommend that, that by one, yeah. Uh, Suarez. Yeah. Uh, that was probably the, the best kind of asteroid mining, you know, space book I've seen yeah. in a while. And it, it makes a great case for not colonizing Mars is that they just, no matter what you do to it, it's still not earth. And if mm -hmm. it's not earth or even closely approximating it, it's a, uh, not worth doing, mm -hmm. uh, going down that gravity hole because it just won't fit us. Um, uh, yeah, those are the top two. I think Excellent. would appeal. Yeah. yeah, I do. I read a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I'm reading a lot of uh, uh, science fiction, obviously, and, mm -hmm. and so to try to stay ahead. Um, and I game too. Yeah. Um, one of the things I got out of gaming, I, I, I do a kind of classic Skyrim, mm -hmm. and I modded it. And you know, you can mod everything. You can mod it in incredible detail. You can change the environment. You can change how people interact. You can change the clothing. You can change, uh, you know, how you fight and do all this. Other. I mean, it's, it's, it's moddable to an infinite degree, and mods come in at 15 a day from a huge community. Everyone's solving a little problem. And it, it kind of got me mentally ahead um, in terms of thinking about or how to think about what happens when you get AR. Because AR, I mean, as soon as you start to be able to do, you know, modify the visual environment and auditory environment, um, anything's possible. It's, I mean, it's like, I mean, we're worried about fakes and stuff, but it, it, I'm thinking more in terms of uh, changing the entire environment, changing how everybody looks to you, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> not just the, inf not the, just the kind of digital information that, uh, that, that comes in or the, the uh, alphabetical information, but, you know, uh, is what, what the interior of your house looks like, what the interior of your office looks like, uh, mm -hmm. what's the kind of sounds in the background. And, and, and I mean, everything is modeled. Yeah. Right. If you think yeah, it does, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, it changes, it, it changes everything. I did a, you know, kind of a start of a novel to over a decade ago where, you know, the focus was on augmented reality. And that was the piece is like, we could be in a bar and where a TV would be for me is playing CNBC and for you, it might be playing the football game, right? Like it's you, right. people start to modify the reality that exists around them to kind of suit their own needs. Right. Uh, exactly. It, it also diminishes the necessity of a lot of technologies, right? You don't need the screens uh, that right. kind of becomes a screen on demand. So. Exactly. And I mean, it, it, it can fragment in terrible ways. I mean, if you think of it as layers, um, mm. uh, you could, have a Nazi layer. So everybody in that layer is, yeah. is all seeing the world from a Nazi perspective or mm -hmm. seeing it from a communist perspective or seeing through any kind of horrible thing that you could possibly have uh, imagined. And, and they build mods to do that, right? Yeah. And then it, there's this fragmentation of humanity that, 
that results from that. Place, yeah. yeah I, um, I call them, them the Augs and the non-Augs, right? Because I expected there would be an inherent conflict between the people that choose to live in the augmented reality even and the folks yeah. that choose not to, right? That just want to want to interpret reality as it's coming in natively. So. Yeah, I, I kind of, I, I was writing some fiction and I'm, I'm what it would be like if you created kind of all the kind of uh, classes you get in a kind of D&D D &D classes or superhero classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was done through AR when everyone's using AR because it's so much more engaging than regular life. Mm -hmm. I mean, regular life looked drab in comparison. I mean, until you have this stuff, all this extra data and color and sound and, and it would be so much more is that you could build almost all of those classes inside of that perceptual layer of people. I mean, um, changing people based on, um, and giving them superpowers based on giving them information in the right way at the right time yeah. and giving them power to influence the other, what other people see yeah. hear, and taste. And that kind of thing, it, it, it was kind of a cool thing because you actually could see it happening. You could see how this, you know, all these classes actually played through. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Well, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time oh, my pleasure. to chat with us and we'll definitely link. I would encourage the folks to check out the Global Gorilla site and Patreon site. So we'll make sure there are links to that below. Thanks. Thanks again so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to this OODA Loop production. For the latest analysis on cybersecurity, technology, and global risks, please visit www dot oodaloop dot com.